Because that information is available on the site that you can find all the Transactor magazines archived in PDF format. I think the article is good enough. If you really wanted to build one of those things, you could do it from that. What I will talk about, though, is why we even thought that it would be a thing to do and how some of the problems I had in getting it to actually work. Uh, I'm going to do that toward the end of the talk because this is actually, I'm taking advantage of this to do three reminiscences about computing back in the 80s with Commodore. Uh, my name's Noel Nyman. Most of us who were doing work at the time uh, where we thought we might actually have to file anything with the IRS for taxes and that sort of thing had company names as well. And mine is GUI Duck Developmental Systems. It is pronounced GUI Duck for real, even though it's not spelled that way. And I tend to think of it as GUI Duck or GUI Duck Developmental. And as a result, you may occasionally find it references GUI Duck Developmental Services or some other thing that starts with an S at the end, because I kept forgetting what the real name was. Okay, in 1983, Compute published an article by Joel Shepard, which he called Extra Instructions. And the extra instructions were additional opcodes he discovered that seemed to do stuff in the 6502 series processors. <coughs> I want to do just a brief overview of opcodes. <coughs> a microprocessor is designed to do operations, stuff. Load the accumulator, transfer something from the accumulator to the X register, that kind of thing. Add, subtract. Then how it accomplishes everything that we see the C64, the C128, and many other machines do is done with those kinds of codes. The codes are frequently referenced by mnemonics. Whoops, wrong button. Oh, here we go. Uh, mnemonics, which look kind of like the names of the instructions. So this would be referred to as load A. And in this case, it has an address. And this is how you would see it in most of the books. Some of the books list things together kind of like this, although they'll show a number of addressing um, options for each of the operations, and those each have their own mnemonic. The computer doesn't use mnemonics, of course, it uses hex codes. And so what you would enter if you were entering directly into computer memory is the hex code AD. Many of the operations take operands. Some take one, some take two. This one happens to take two. It's a absolute address instruction, which goes, we'll see in a minute how that works. Some of the operands, such as these over here, do not, some of the op, op codes do not take operands. There are no op, which does nothing, but takes the machine cycles to do it, which can be useful. And the break command, which we will be using uh, in some of our stuff. This is how you generally don't see the operations codes listed for the 6502 series. These are all of the codes listed in a matrix. Each of the rows shows the, uh, the first or leftmost hex digit. So all of the codes that start with zero are on this row. The columns show the rightmost hex digit, so all of the commands that end with one show up in this row. There are 151 defined or documented, I prefer the documented, opcodes for the 6502 series processor. That's all the things that have white backgrounds. A lot of blue there. Those are undefined. And you notice none of the defined outcodes ends in a 3, a B, or an F, and only one ends in a 2. And if you look at the cross here, we can see some of our friends that we just introduced. For example, there are the load A, load X, and load Y. There's break. And down here somewhere is no one. Okay, so the question is, we've got these other codes, so we could enter a code such as 02. The processor is not supposed to recognize that. What Shepard's article pointed out is that, in fact, it does recognize many of these, at least the ones he tested, and some of them do interesting things, like they'll load the A register and the X register with the same value, for example. And you, you can see that there might be some value to that. So he did some testing, and we'll take a look at how you would test a documented opcode first. So this is load A from the absolute address. In memory, you would enter the AD for the load A opcode, and then the 
two hex digit address in low high format. And then you want to put a zero at the end, because if you don't put a zero at the end, the processor will just keep doing stuff. And that's all we want to do. We want to stop as soon as we get done with this and see did the right thing happen. So if the right thing happens, the processor will go to address 1603, finds the value D3, and sticks it in the accumulator. That's a documented opcode, works. Dr. Eugene Galander taught a class that I attended at the UW in 1965. That dates me quite a bit. And he, he had, there's two things I remember from that class. One of them is he liked to play with test formats. And I don't think he ever did the same test format twice for a class. And the test he gave us at one point was the most interesting and unusual multi-answer uh, test that I have ever seen. And if you want, we can talk about that after the end of the program. But he did come up with this as well. Never let anyone keep you working from a problem you find interesting. I read the Shepard article and I said, this is way cool. Matter of fact, I did not even read the entire article before I was over at my Commodore 64 trying his tests. And to do the testing, let's cover just a little bit of types of software testing, you may be familiar with this. Over on the far right, we got white box testing, which I always thought should be called clear box testing because it means you can see the code. And, but people like white box, so we'll pretend that you can see through the white. And it means that you could see exactly what was in, the computer was instructed to do, usually in a high level language. If you're testing a microprocessor though, most of us can't see the code. The code is implemented by transistors. The transistors are created by some kind of a mask or a template in a manufacturing process. We can't see that. We can't do white box testing on a regular processor. We can. There are people who can. We can. Gray box testing means you don't have access to the code, but you can see the specification. In other words, every function that's supposed to be done by this particular piece of software is something that's defined for you. So you can go and test the specification even if you can't see the code, that's exactly what we just did with load A absolute. We tested the specification because it's provided for us. Black box testing is testing where you don't have the specification. Generally, you know kind of what the thing is supposed to do. You know, I've got a word processor, I've got a game, I've got an old style adventure game, and some of those adventure games, you really didn't know what the heck to do. It said, you're in the middle of this, you got this happening, enter a command, and you had to guess what the heck that was. That would be kind of black box testing. Testing the undocumented opcodes is actually ultimate black box testing. And I first encountered this when I was getting electronics training from teachers who like to be particularly nasty. <laughs> and they would hand you a black box like this. This one's got uh, five switches, it's got a knob that turns, it's got six LEDs and six terminal posts. Don't let the screws fool you, they either glued the lid on, or those are fake screws, or sometimes when you, if you manage to take the lid off, a siren would go off, any of those was a fail. You were not to take this apart. Your job is to draw the schematic. Your job is to draw the underlying, kind of either the spec or the code, and you don't know what it's supposed to do. That's what testing the undocumented opcodes was like, because we had no idea what they would do, if anything. So we were faced with something like this. So here's kind of how you approached it, and uh, Shepard is not quite this specific, but he must have done something like this. So you start out and you center record values in everything that you think might change. The X, Y, and X and Y registers especially, you probably don't want to set to zero, because if they're zero and you're using indexed addressing, you won't see it. If you set you, either of them in the accumulator and you do an AND or an OR, you won't see that either. So you probably want to set a value there. What value? Don't know. Does it take an operand? Might be a zero page thing. Does it take two operands? Might be a address outside zero page. Uh, might be numbers that it uses, load A with this value, immediate, that kind of thing. So we don't know. And that was some of the entertainment of testing these things 
because you could spend quite a bit of time dinking around, figuring out what was going to go on. So you'd enter something like this, you'd enter an un undocumented opcode, one or two numbers maybe, and the break, execute it, and then look to see what's changed. Notice the stack pointer is there. Normally we don't see a lot of things changing the stack pointer unless we push or pull from the stack. Some of these opcodes turns out change the stack pointer very nicely. I don't know why. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. This is directly from Shepard's article. And he talked about all of this stuff, and this is toward the end, and he said there are these two exceptions, 9E and 9F. One of them ends with the X register, the other ends with the A register, the accumulator. And they both end with the number 4, the pound sign up here. Uh, where is the pound sign up here indicates this is an immediate value that comes from outer space or somewhere. And he says right here, the origin of 04 is unknown. Just out of curiosity, first of all, let's see what he's doing here. He's entering what he would enter in memory from a, a mo machine language monitor. These are the mnemonics, and he made up a mnemonic for this uh, 9 e code. So he's, put, he's loading X with the value in 0 page F6. I have no idea what that is. Then he's executing the undocumented opcodes, and he's using address 0304. Anybody recognize what 0304 might be? Anybody besides Ken? Back in the dark ages, there was a VIC-20, and before that, there was a pet CBM. They had very little memory, and when you were trying to do any kind of sophisticated basic, you had to scrounge every last byte of memory that you could for your basic program. Then if you wanted to add machine code, you're in trouble because there's no place to do it. Well, there was one place, especially when you got to be able to use floppy disk drives instead of the data set, and that was what's called the take buffer. And down in the range of 0340, there are a series of sequential bytes that the Commodores use if they're bringing in value or sending value out to the data set and for no other purpose. So if you weren't going to use tape, you had that area free to put your machine code. I suspect that Mr. Shepard learned on either the PET or the VIC-20. And so he was used to putting his machine code there, and that's why he picked that address. I didn't. I started Commodore with the Commodore 64. Lots of memory. Lots of places to put stuff. So when I did my first test of his thing with the 04, I didn't get an AND with 04. I got an AND with a larger number. Don't remember what it was. And my first reaction was, maybe different machines have different numbers. That's interesting. Then I went back and replicated his test exactly, and I got 04. I said, you know, computers, microprocessors generally are not random. It's very hard to make one random. So this is coming from somewhere. A little experimentation showed me that what it's doing is taking the high byte of the address, or the page number, incrementing it, and using that as the AND value. Just as an added thing, a thing he doesn't show us in either of these, is that he must have zero in the Y register because it is an indexed Y addressing mode, not an absolute addressing mode. But, aha, I think I've got this. I'm going to have some people do some stuff with other machines, but I think I've got this. 9F, however, and if you saw Ken's presentation yesterday, you may remember that when I did some documentation for the Swiftling cartridge for developers, I screwed up the documentation. I made it look prettier and didn't bother to test the pretty version before I sent it out. Take a look at this. We've got the same general notion here, but now he's loading an immediate value of 06, which is fine, and putting it in 0, 0, 0, 0. That's a real curious address to use, because it's not a free address. It's part of the system that the Commodore computers all use to decide what the I.O. should be. Should we be putting the basic ROM in, or should we be putting RAM there instead? And one of the bits here helps control that. Other bits control other things like that. So putting stuff there is not a good idea, generally. And I don't know exactly what happens if you do, and then you run a, run a command like testing this thing. 
because I don't know if the Commodore is going to merrily go in and change it back on you, or if something else is going to not work right, or it may work just fine. But it seemed kind of strange because, remember, what I discovered is that it's taking the page, high, the, the high byte of the page, or the page address of the high byte of the address, incrementing it using that for an AND. Increment zero, you get one. He says you're still ANDing with four. One of two things happened. Perhaps Mr. Shepard did the same thing I did with the SwiftLink documentation. He said, I shouldn't be using the same address all the time. I'll use zero, zero, and just filled it in and didn't bother to test it. I hope that's not what he did. I hope instead that an editor changed it. <laughs> because the editors like to change stuff, uh, to, to give Transactor their credit. I, I did a fair amount of writing for Transactor over the years. They never changed a word of anything I wrote. They really, really thought something was crazy, they would contact me, but they usually just printed it as is and let me suffer the consequences. But I have had other magazine editors add paragraphs to something I wrote and not indicate that it was mine. If you look at the uh, start of uh, the, the intro that we saw briefly on the first slide uh, in italics, I think that was all written by an editor because the first sentence makes no sense at all. So, we've now got, we'll ignore that zero, zero thing, but I've now got the situation where I know, I think I know what these two commands do, and they're not what Shepard says they do. So, at the time, I was involved in the University of Washington Commodore Users Group, and one of my responsibilities was coming up with things to talk about at the meetings, and when I couldn't come up with anybody else to talk about something, I talked about what I had available, and I talked about this. And um, at the time, one of our members, Chris Newman, who was still in high school then, was working on a set of disk utilities he called disk maintenance. And one of the things he wanted to do was add optionally to his disassembler the undocumented opcodes. Because he knew they existed. I did not. But he, he'd been doing this stuff since grade school, I think, at CBM days. And the reason he wanted to add them to his disassembler is that he said some applications use them for their copy protection. I'd never seen that, had no idea, but Ken Sullivan has. I'd like Ken to come up and talk to us a little bit about what he discovered. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Special guest. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ken. Yes, yeah, so very briefly. Um, in college, I was using uh, a Commodore 64 for uh, writing papers. I was a tech writing major, so um, of course, the Commodore 64 is a 40 column uh, computer. You can sort of do 80 columns with some software, you know, trickery, kind of redoing the, the display screen as a high res graphics thing, but it's not really practical for doing word processing because the performance is bad. So those of us doing word processing and doing a lot of it, me being a writing major was that way. Uh, 40 columns was it, but that was irritating when you're trying to get final formatting on things because you have to scroll left to right to make sure it's all just perfect. What a, what a pain. So I was overjoyed when I found a, a hardware product called the uh, Batteries Included BI-80 80, 80 column card. Neat piece of hardware plugged into the cartridge port and had uh, composite as well as some sort of separated output, if I remember right. And it looked pretty good on a monochrome monitor. It was nice, crisp 80 columns. So great, there's the hardware, where's the software? Well, they had trouble getting people to support it software-wise, but they did manage to convince the person who wrote the <laughs> word processor that they sold, called Paperclip, to update it to support the batteries included card. So I was overjoyed. I, I mean, I was a college kid, I had no money, but I actually spent money and bought this thing. <laughs> Uh, brand new, uh, loaded it up, started typing, and you know whatever, managed to hit the run stop key and the program froze. And I'm like, what? And I, re I was able to replicate this. So basically, you know, you remember sort of what the Commodore keyboard layout is. Run stop is a place where your fingers are going to touch sooner or later if you aren't the world's greatest touch typist, and I certainly am not. So it was kind of unusable. You know, you have to hold your breath the whole time you're typing a six-page paper or whatever. 
So I was like, ah! So I turned to my friend Roy Riggs, who was a, I mentioned him yesterday during my presentation. He was the uh, same age as me at Purdue, fantastic uh, Commodore uh, programmer, went on to be a software engineer for his career. And he said, oh, let me take a look at this. So, I mean, it's a word processor, right? The disk it comes on is not copy protected. How hard could this be to figure out what the problem is? So we load it up, he loads it up on there watching him. He's using a machine language monitor, probably Micromon or something. He's paging through the code, and all of a sudden, it's, it's garbage on the screen. And he's like, what in the world is going on? And he's like, okay, well, this is going to crash as soon as I hit go. And it went right through the garbage and came back out another code. He's like, what just happened? So basically, to make a long story even longer, that word processor, for reasons of uh, copy protection, sort of, used undocumented opcodes to make it hard to figure out what it was doing during the kind of boot up sequence and all that sort of stuff. Pretty crazy. So we, uh, he managed to figure it out. I don't even know, because your article hadn't been published yet. I don't think, because this would have been like 1985, 86. Uh, 85 was about. Well, maybe we found your article. Maybe. Wouldn't that have been funny if we had well, found your article we'll before I knew you? stuff that you might have found. Might have found other stuff too. Because yeah. yeah. Noel and I didn't meet till 1989. Something like that. Anyway, so we figured it out and it turned out to be, uh, there's a lookup table to tell Paperclip what to do with various key presses and there was uh, one little byte for the run stop key and it had a bit wrong and so it caused it to crash. So he fixed that and we saved it to disk and I went on my way. And then, then I called batteries included because you know their internet wasn't much of a thing in those days. And strangely, they didn't really care that we had fixed a bug in their program. Either because they had sold exactly two copies of Paperclip <laughs> for the Better's Included card, or maybe because they were in the process of being bought by Electronic Arts about that time, and so maybe they just had their hands full with other stuff. But they did allow me to, to uh, upload a fixed version of it to, I think it was Quantum Link uh, bulletin board. So, there could be one other person in the world that has the fixed version of this word processor. If anybody else bothered to download it, I don't know. Cool. So, there Thank we go. You Appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. So there were, and there were games apparently. Um, someone later sent me a, a, the code from a game that was used as part of the copy protection. We'll see that maybe that wasn't the smartest thing for them to do. So, uh, we wanted to do this for disk maintenance. That meant it was going to be a commercial product we really need to make sure what we've got is correct. And so Chris and I and a couple of other people, as I recall, started doing testing. We tested on the PET CBM, Commodore 64, VIC-20, uh, Plus 4, and somebody had an Apple II, which had a 6502 in it. And we tested on all of those and verified this is what all of these commands do. Uh, it's because you remember I mentioned the stack pointer, I'm not clear that everybody used exactly the same rigorous testing. I'm not clear that I did. And so it's conceivable that we missed some stuff. I think we did pretty good. Anyway, we documented that, and along with the disk maintenance program, people got a chart that showed what the undocumented opcodes are, what we thought they would be. And did he make his own disassembler? And yes, did he did. I he see. already had the disassembler. I see. And like everybody else, he came up, fortunately, he had to stay with three uh, letter mnemonics, but they were never the same as anybody else's. So anyone who came up with mnemonics in this thing, they were virtually all all different. So this gives me an opportunity to talk about the covers on Transactor magazine. <laughs> uh, by the way, the guy, Transactor guy sent me this shirt some time back, and as you can maybe tell, I'm not going to fit into that shirt, so it belongs to Kent now. And <coughs> are, your, are your kids Still small enough to fit in there? I can't bring myself to wear a piece of history like that. <laughs> okay, cool. I think it's going to end up at the Living Computer Museum is what I think. <laughs> well, at one time, I thought that Byte Magazine did the best covers in the computer world. Mm. And I still think their small talk cover is excellent. And mm. you can go find libraries of all of the covers of Byte Magazine. I like creative computing, too. Transactor blows them away. Yep. Transactor is, I mean, this is just, how, how do you beat something like that? It's not technically a magazine, but it's done by the same guy, Carl Hilden. And this was the Complete Commodore Interspace Anthology. It is a multi-page document that lists all of the technical information you might ever need on every computer made up to the time. So it includes C64, it doesn't have C128 in it. Um, so I 
got a copy of this, and I found this, tucked way in the back. Extra opcodes. Remember, I like undocumented opcodes. Remember, Shepard called them extra opcodes. <coughs> and here's this little tiny chart that appears to be complete in the sense that there are 105 undocumented opcodes, and there may be 105 listed there. But two things about it. First of all, he says the mnemonics, oops, sorry, wrong button again. The mnemonics come from Granger's article in iPod January of 81. I was intrigued by the 81 at the time, but I had no idea what iPod was. And as I kind of mentioned, we didn't have an internet really in those days. We had bulletin boards here and there. So I had no way to track it down, but, and programming the pet CBM by Ray West. That I had. But notice down here, we have 90 and 9F, ending with the immediate 04, and adding mask bit 2 which is what an AND with 04 would do, but it just reinforces, that's its purpose, is to mask bit 2. Well, I already knew it didn't do that. It only did that if you stored your stuff in page 3. And I said, well, that's not good. So I went to Ray West, which I did happen to have his book. And way back on page 489, he talks about what he calls pseudo-op codes. Hmm. Like somehow they're not real op codes, like a pseudonym, you know. Notice I've enlarged the area where 9E, really 9s are in his chart. No 9E and 9F at all in this list. Down here, he talks about these commands are not part of the thing, and you really probably shouldn't use them. If you want to use them, you can't rely on them, and yada, yada, yada. That's probably why it's on page 489 of this book. Well, we now have the fabulous internet. And I can now find iPod. Woo! The Independent Pet Users Group out of Great Britain. And they means by that is and with X and the accumulator with X and store it in an address. I think that's what the second A is supposed to mean. Hmm. And he's indicating and I think he meant both of them were to be absolute, but he had, doesn't have an S here, maybe not, uh, that they are Y-indexed. So he's got most of what I found, and yet none of this and with some magical number, and you'd think that would be hard to miss, since the number that's stuck out in memory is not the original number you started with. It's ended with something. So this puzzled me. I, I wasn't clear what was going on. So. About that time, when I'm thinking about this, and frankly, following Dr. Galanter's notion, I was still interested, but not vitally interested. I'd done the work with Chris for the uh, this maintenance product. I was not going to use any of these things in any programs I'm writing. And I just kind of, you know, sort of on the back burner once in a while would come up, maybe. So, another very cool transactor cover, and in this is the Jim McLaughlin article. Mr. McLaughlin says that Mr. Shepard was not right about some stuff. Got that. And here's what's really going on. Not quite. And I've sort of pulled sections out of here. And he's, I, I think, overloading A again here because he's doing A and this number. And then I think he means address here. And he's perpetuating the same 04 which tells me I'm going to give him credit for actually testing the code. I think he tested using the same page 3 address or one of his relatives. And I said, OK, Carl Hilden, I like you. You are a technical guy. You've got it wrong in two publications now. We really need to fix this. <laughs> and I sent him a letter. And I said, did it, did it, did it, all this stuff. So, talked to Chris Newman, got his permission, sent him a copy of the chart we did for disk maintenance. So we had all the stuff that we had done and we had tested. My letter arrived, and in this, ver this issue with Transactor, it arrived the same day as our letter from Ray Quirling in Kirby, Oregon, saying not exactly the same thing, starting out with one of my favorite sentences, people who investigate undocumented opcodes deserve all the headaches they get. <laughs> um, and we probably do. But both of us came up with, no, Shepard's not 100% right here. 
and they published both articles. And in that issue, which you can find online, is the chart that we did for reflexive software. So I thought, okay, I'm done. I've, I've sent it to Transactor. Uh, that is the ultimate tech source for things like this in the Commodore world, and so I don't need to worry about this anymore. So, all done? Not exactly. <coughs> Because now I'm going to talk about something I learned from this that had nothing to do specifically, but was, was actually a valuable lesson. In the 1980s, I worked for junk mail. He liked to call it direct mail marketing. <laughs> uh, I didn't think that was quite descriptive because we didn't, every, we didn't all only mail advertising. We mailed newsletters. We did the Washington State Bar Association newsletter, which was a very thick magazine once a month. We did several specialty newspapers that we mailed as well. We used PDP 11s, and I think this is a new version. I assumed it was PDP 12 until I saw the PDP 12 out here on the floor, and it's quite a bit newer. Um, intriguing device. It uh, program when you boot it, you set the boot address, boot addresses, and the data to put in them with these paddles switches done in octal. This thing up here is a different version than we had, but it's essentially a cross between a floppy drive and a hard disk because it's a hard platter that's 12 inches in diameter, but not in a sealed container. And the heads fly above it, so they, you know, whatever, however the hell that works. And it did work, and it pulled, held a whopping one megabytes of data. And uh, the PDP-11s we had used a couple of them to get enough data so we could do the work we needed to do. At that time, this is the middle 1980s now, uh, before that, a lot of the people that were our customers had us maintain their word product, their um, address labels, their address lists. And that meant some extra work for them. They would send us hard copy, we would enter it. By the mid-1980s, most of them had IBM PCs. Some of them were even in networks of all things. And they were maintaining their own address lists. So what that meant is every time they wanted to do a mailing, they would send us a text file. And one of my jobs was to take that text file and figure out what the hell format did they use this time and get it into a format that we could send to the PDP-11s. So that was one of the things I did fairly often. When things got to the out of the PDP-11, they would produce hard copy, nice wide paper, track your feet, not a printer as new as that by any means. And we generally printed the labels four across, one inch high. And then they came to this machine, and this is the exact model machine I ran for many, many years for that guy. It's called a Kirk Rudy, because that's what makes it. And you would take your material and stick it in here, a stack of it, had to be a stack. And between suction and pushers, it would pull one off the bottom and move it this way. At the same time, back here, behind it on a, a shelf or on the floor, if it was a thick enough list, was your list that came out of here. And a series of slitters and knives would cut the tractor feeds off, cut the labels, make four labels out of each one, feed them to this little wheel, which would then pull one label down, put glue on the back, slap it onto the material going underneath it, and drop it onto a 10-foot stacker sitting out here. And then it would be sorted for discount mailing. I'm going to use the term bulk mailing. One of the user group newsletters we sent out was for Apple. I have no idea the scope of this Apple user group, but it had to be at least the United States, might have even been global, because they had a big enough budget to have a real office in Kent, Washington with real office staff. And when they wanted to print a newsletter, they sent it to a real printer who printed a magazine format and charged them real money to do that. <laughs> And then they send it to us to mail, and we charge them real money to mail it. Now, I'd never been involved with another user group where we came even close. We had trouble coming up with postage. Usually, usually did the printing in somebody's uh, boss's office, free of charge at night, that kind of thing. <coughs> so we had this thing, and again, about every, every month, I had to call the office manager and say, OK, what format is this? because they never sent the same format twice, so I knew her fairly well. And I also got to read the newsletter. And one day I'm reading the newsletter, and it mentions something about 64, 6502 machine code, because the Apple II used that. Uh, but wait a minute. These guys have a 6502. 
I wonder if any of them has done anything with opcodes. And so I call the office manager who knows nothing about what opcodes are, but she put me in touch with an editor. And the editor says, you need to contact Bob Sanders Cedarloaf. Bob Sanders Cedarloaf was putting out, had been putting out, I, I don't know if he stopped at this point, a thing called the Apple assembly line. And he focused primarily on machine code for the 6502 and that general ill probably moved on to Mac when that became available. This is volume one, issue six. He's now proud of the fact he's sending 300 copies. And notice the date over there underneath this picture, March of 81. Come back to that in a bit. This one includes the complete 6502. Oh, I was going to pass this around, by the way. Might as well do it now. This is my one piece of trivia from the junk mailer. I think that's from a mainframe that he bought thinking he could use that instead of the PDP 11s. This is a magnetic core memory board and it was used like we would use scratch pad RAM now. And if you look on Wikipedia you can see examples and all sorts of the hardware that's necessary to support that. That can hold a whopping 128 bytes of memory. It has the advantage that it's static memory because those little cores get magnetized and until you demagnetize them on purpose they stay that way. So if you had a total failure and you probably had a number of those boards or boards much bigger than that, you could do something called a core dump to figure out what went wrong and we still use the term even though nobody uses this anymore. <laughs> right. So I contacted Bob Sanders Cedarloaf and he sent me a copy of the Apple assembly line. And Here's an example. He says it has 104 unused opcodes. He calls them unused and so-called unused. He preceded Mr. Trump by decades in using the term so-called. Um, but what I, he also has in here a chart that shows all of the undocumented opcodes that he found and tested. And I've added his stuff to the chart that I showed you earlier. So everything that's in blue is something that Bob Sanders Cedarloaf discovered and is identical with what we had on the reflexive software chart. There's one up here, just to be complete, there's one up here in purple, and when Sanders Cedarloaf did his chart, he mistyped the code. The code is correct in the description of the test that he did, and so I fixed that for him. But notice that there are five of these cells that are kind of tan. Now, this one over here is interesting. Well, this one over here is interesting. Because it's virtually, this is 9E, and it's virtually identical to what we discovered. Notice he's using the term HEA for high effective address. And he's incrementing the high effective address. That's exactly what we had discovered. So he found this. It is using index addressing. The only thing that he says it also does that we may have missed is the stack pointer. But notice 9F, which is virtually the same except working with A instead of X. Totally different. It looks very similar, if you remember Granger, looks very similar to what Granger had, except Granger says it's indexed by X, by Y, and here he's saying it's indexed by X. Plus, there's another HEA way down here that's nothing like what we discovered. So, what does this mean? It's a practical matter. I don't know what it means, but I can guess. And we'll get to that right toward the end. Here. So, one of the things I was interested in doing is testing not only the MOS processors, which is everything we were testing in Commodore World, but Synertech and Rockwell, who licensed the 6502 templates and use for MOS and were producing them. Sanders Cedarloaf's Apple II used a Synertech. He even identifies the date of manufacture and the version and says, may not work the same on future versions. Well, I think he's right about that. The versions that we got are much newer. 
and they did work the same in the limited testing I did. I did not do full testing. Like I said, I pretty much burned out on, on <laughs> codes by this point. Um, but I happened that I think something to do with reflexive software, or maybe it was something else, I'm not sure. But I heard that Rockwell was making a modem chip that was using the 6502 as a base. In other words, they were taking the 6502 and modifying all kinds of stuff on it to make it into a modem. And I thought, that's interesting. And so I contacted a Rockwell engineer somehow or another. And uh, he said, yeah, we're doing that. We talked about that a bit. And I said, you know, we've done a bunch of work with opcodes, on undocumented opcodes. Do, does the modem use those? And he said, well, no. He says, here's the thing. And I mentioned a lot, I was also looking for Rockwell and Synertech chips. He says, the thing is, we license that stuff from Moss. So because we license it, we can't change anything. We have to do it exactly the way they do it. But the modem chip is not the same deal. And so we went in and made no ops out of all of those. So if you try to do anything, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to go past them. Well, that got me to thinking as I was preparing this presentation. I wonder if Moss, which does have the reputation for changing their stuff, especially early on, I wonder if the chips they were making back in 81, probably 1980, that Granger worked with and that Sander Cedarloaf worked with, had differences in them that made those opcodes that we found not work the same way. I trust Sander Cedarloaf, he's an engineer, and if you read the article, which is available online, uh, you'll see why I think he's a reasonable kind of trust. So I suspect he and Granger were seeing different behaviors in 9E and 9F. I suspect that Moss changed the chips and if in fact the Rockwell and Synertech followed the same things, I suspect that that's because they had to because they license it. And when Moss makes a change, you got to make the change too. Now the thing that I learned from this, which is not quite anything about opcodes, is that in the late 1980s, it occurred to me that the Apple people use 6502 processors. And why the heck, I, most of the Commodore folks I dealt with were very Commodore specific. We had Commodore logo stuff and uh, we only had Commodore machines and we didn't waste any time with Atari because they were game machines and Apple <laughs> were too expensive and all of this stuff. And I wonder if I, what I would have known about Commodore if I had gone and sat in Apple computer group meetings, sat in the back and didn't look like a Commodore guy and just kind of listened. And it was a lesson I learned much too late and now it probably doesn't apply because we got the fabulous internet. And you do a search, and you're going to find Sander Cedarloaf as well as everything. You do a good search. You'll find Sander Cedarloaf as well as everything about a Commodore. Now for something completely different. In 1986, the summer of 1986, the first C-128s appeared in the local dealer stores, and I actually got my hands on them. And I got to play with it. It had a lot, especially that 80 column that, that Kent worked really hard to get on his C64. Uh, it was right there, and by golly, that was cool. That was neat. But one of the things I discovered, and again, I like getting into the, the, the guts of these things, the late and sadly missed Jim Butterfield put a, wrote a number of articles in Transactor and some other places, and he talked about the 80 column video. He talked about the video memory, actually both 80 and 40 sheriff, and that the address chip, which addresses all the video, could address the full 64K of screen RAM, but Commodore chose to use two chips called a 4416, which together make the screen RAM and only have 16K of it available. And somewhere, I'm not sure, I can't find it in Butterfield, but somewhere I discovered that there is supposedly a chip called a 4464. And the 4464 is pin for pin compatible with the 4416, but has 64K of RAM, which the existing address chip can address. And I said, this is cool. I need to do something with that. So I called Almac Strom no longer exists. At the time, they were in this building, which is just off I-90 up in Bellevue. 
And they sold wholesale. They sold chips wholesale to people who make things with chips. But way back here, there are warehouses in the back here, and way back here, one of these doors was an entrance into the warehouse. And there was a counter there, and they were nice enough to sell you retail single quantities if you wanted to buy retail from the part of the warehouse guy. And I said, do you have 4464s? And he said, yes, we do. And I said, hold two of them. I will come get them. And I was working for the junk mailer down in the south end, and I had to drive up through Bellevue to get to my apartment in Redmond. And so I stopped at Elmac Strong, got there before he closed. And I was expecting that he was going to bring me a couple of chips that are about like that, because they're 18 pin DIP chips. What I got instead was a couple of chips that look like that. And I said, those aren't going to fit on the circuit board. <laughs> what the heck is this? So he pulled the spec, and to pull the spec in those days, you went to a filing cabinet and pulled out the drawer and pulled out a piece of paper and gave it to me. And he said, why is that not what you're expecting? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, well, let me see what I can find out. So he went off to do whatever it is he does, and I'm reading the spec sheet. And what this big chip, which said 4464 on it, big as life. What that big chip is, is an 8, 8 by 8K S RAM, static RAM, right? 8 by 8K. That's the size of a small Commodore cartridge. Two of them are the size of a big Commodore cartridge. And I'm looking at the spec sheet, and the current drain to retain the memory is so low that the battery should last months to hold that information. And I said, you know, I could make a RAM cartridge out of this thing. I think. I think I could. Meantime, he comes back with something that looks like this. Has numbers have nothing to do with 4464. And if you read the article that I'll talk about later briefly, uh, you'll see what numbers I came up with. But I said, I'll take all four of them. So I contact I have the to replace these, you've got to remove the existing 4416s from the Commodore 128. And it's a double-sided board. And I did not feel competent to do that desoldering. So I contacted the tech who works for one of the, the dealers. And we made a deal. I bought two more of the memory chips. Went up there after hours, split a pizza. He unsoldered my chips. I think he put sockets in mine. And we installed the replacements. And then he did his board. And together we worked on the thing. And we actually got. 64 memory, we could do multiple screens, or we could stick stuff in that extra 48K. So, as usual, took this to the Commodore user group, showed them the cool things you could do. If you did 40 column screens, you could do a whole ton of them and switch back and forth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Kind of like a El Cheapo PowerPoint. <laughs> <coughs> and sent them an article. Another very cool. And that article was upgrade to C128 with 48K randoms. At the same time, I mentioned, and I got a couple of these, and I think I can make a cartridge out of these things. And one of the members named John Bush said, I'd like to work with you on that. So we now finally come to the RAM cartridge. And so I think he came over to my apartment on a Saturday, and we had a, a board that plugged in to the user port. And we could pull the lines that we needed off of that board, bring them down to a solderless breadboard, plug in the chips, plug in all the other parts, fiddle around, make mistakes, fix it. And we actually got the thing to work. We could do, say, machine code. We could save, I think we did something like Simon's Basic, or maybe do we just did Banana, like Buffer Butterfield like to do for Ready. Uh, it, it seemed to work pretty well. So OK, this is cool. The problem is, you don't want to solder a spreadboard that size hanging off the back end of your Commodore 64, or your C128 for that matter. So I wanted to do a um, cartridge size board. Now at the time, I had a solder, a, a, a wire wrap system that I wish I still had. Meantime, I'm going to pass this around. This is the actual prototype board. 
And a wire wrap system used a roll of enamel wire sat on the top of the tool. And you stuck the tool down on top of the post, twisted it around, and in the twisting process, a knife took the enamel off the inside, so it made electrical contact, but left all the rest of the enamel in place. Hmm. So it still stayed insulated. And you then lifted it up, moved it over to the next pot, you could do daisy chains, really worked very nicely. And that's what I used to build the prototype. It didn't work. <laughs> And by didn't work, I mean everything that we have been doing with our software on the uh, on the serverless breadboard, nah, didn't work at all. I figured, okay, I zap the CMOS chips because those static RAMs are CMOS. Now, CMOS is very sensitive to static. At least they always said so. I never had much problem until now. So I went to uh, called Al Max Strom, said I need two more of those. Drove up, couldn't get out of the work quite as early, got to Almac, and he's just locking the door. He recognized who I was, unlocked the door, let me come in and buy the chips from him. And I went home, I used the insulated wrist strap, I insulated the, the insertion tool that you can use to insert the things in the sockets. Didn't work. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's not, that's not the problem. So, wiring error, trace every line. As you can see from that board, tracing every line is tricky when all of the wires have the same insulation color and they're that tightly packed together. I don't recall that I actually ever found an error. I may have, I don't know. You can also see on my soldering there kind of why I didn't want to unsolder something myself from a C128 board. Um, I don't know that I've actually found an error. In, in these, those days, I tended to try one more thing until about 2 a.m. <laughs> give up at that point, and it was probably about 2 a.m., and I had to go to work the next day. So, didn't work. So the next thing I tried was, is it a software error? Now, I don't think, I don't understand why I would have thought this. Timing, maybe? Because it worked on the solderless breadboard. So why the hell would the software have to be different working with the thing on the cartridge? But I tried, I, we tried, I tried all kinds of stuff. Still didn't work. So, I tried variations on what I'm putting in. I tried basic thing, basic programs that you, you know, swap in basic, I tried in everything you would normally find in a cartridge, commercial cartridge, I tried something like that. I tried using each RAM by itself. I tried using both of them together. I tried everything I could think of, all the variations. Still didn't. So now I'm getting a little discouraged. And I'm wishing I had left those two chips on the solderless breadboard and got another, got another one so I could at least have one that worked. So then I thought, I'll, I'll just try text. Probably I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. <laughs> nice. And I saved the tech. And at this point, I should have known what was wrong. Because when I looked at the text, some of the letters were the correct letters in the right place, and most of them were garbage. And I, and I, but I didn't make the connection until I pulled that board out of the computer for the 500th time, and my finger touched one of those terminals that goes to the user port lines, and it moved. And I realized what I had done is soldered those pins in to make the connection and then took a wire wrap tool and twisted on those pins <laughs> to make the connection there and broke the solder joints, interfered with the solder joints, and some of them are floating high and who knows when. And okay, so what I learned from that is do not wire wrap soldered connections, unless you're ready to do what you see my sloppy soldering has done, and that is solder the connections again when you're done. And then it works and life is good. And the last time I used that cartridge, which was 30 years ago, it still worked. The battery's dead by now, I think. Was that, uh, was that Walt Mossberg? Who were you showing in your, uh, your pictures? Oh, that, you don't think that's me? Well, it could be you. It could have been, yeah. Um, it, oh, Richard actually, Attenborough. Right. It's actually Richard Attenborough. <laughs> yeah. I think now I look more like, um, I forget who that is. 
the uh, the guy who did Blackbeard, anyway. Uh -huh. uh, John Malkovich. <laughs> anyway, so I wrote another article. That's the one you can find if you really want to build one of these, and good luck to you. <laughs> and it was in that same issue because Transactor tended to hold articles by topic and publish a, a, a topic of them. That's the one they did. So that is the presentation. Any questions? Cool. Yeah, I. Go ahead. What were you paying for the chips on a, on a per unit basis? Paying at the time? Yeah. I would guess for all four chips that I bought the first time I paid under ten dollars because that was a lot of money. This would, it would have been back in um, 86, 87 along in there I think. It would have been at 86 I think, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I, I really don't remember. It was cheap enough that I didn't mind buying two and, and a pizza to have the chips put in for me. Yeah, Ken. So the, uh, the tool that you no longer have. Yes. That was separate from whomever was making the Commodore ready prototyping boards, right? The, the I guess. I, I had the, that vector tool, and I wish they still made it because I've got a lot of the spools of the player. <laughs> and I don't really have a good way. I don't oh, well, maybe, me maybe Vector did make some boards for Commodore if it was popular. They may enough. have. Yeah, they, yeah. Don't, they don't make the tool anymore, and that's really too bad. I loaned it to somebody, and I'm not sure who or where. And it never, never came back to me. What's the slide switch for? Uh, the slide switch turned, uh, disconnects the battery. Ah. And because what you don't want to do is turn the power off with that slide switch turned on and have the uh, computer try to be powered by the battery. That's not going to work well. Right. The other switches, there are seven of them, but only four of them are used. And so there's three that aren't used at all. Mm. And that was just a switch assembly that I had at the time. So there were commercial versions of things like this for the Commodore, right? I can think of like, wasn't it the quick brown box? Wasn't that one of them? There were several that came out, and I believe they all came out afterwards. I don't think they had anything to do with what I was doing. I think, as the gentleman back there pointed out with price, I think the prices were dropping low enough on things like SRAM. And probably, um, uh, trying to think of the term for the stuff that you can program directly and then reprogram. PLAs? Yeah, PLAs. Well, sort of like PLAs. Um, well, the one I remember was that turbo cartridge. Mm. It was red, had a red plastic shell, and had two push buttons on the back, and then the ads they showed uh, jet flames coming out of it, <laughs> docking into the user port. Uh, that was a cool one. That, uh, and they, they did some amazing things, and they didn't do just, just the RAM cartridge feature. Usually they had other stuff going for them. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Noel, so this was this was just made for your own uh, experimentation. It was never made meant to be a commercial product. Um, I had yet to meet Ken Sullivan. And when you are going to make something and market it, you need somebody who can market stuff. Uh, if you're going to make software and market it, you need someone like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. If you're going to market hardware, Ken Sullivan is handy to have. <laughs> Thank you, Noel. <laughs> and I was quite content to write articles for Transactor and get money. And I remember the first check I got from my wife, uh, my, from Transactor for writing an article. And it was for, I don't remember, maybe $50. And I tried to deal with that, and it was in Canadian funds. <laughs> And I'm not sure how easy it is now, but at that time there was one bank in this area that could handle Canadian, would, would handle Canadian funds. They were called Seattle First National Bank. And I went in to cash the check. And they sent me to some nice lady behind a desk, and she said, well, I don't know these people and I don't know you. And I said, tell you what, can I open an account with this check and you hold the funds until you get them? She said, that I can do. So we did. And I think what I got was $42 US. And my then wife was quite unhappy because we lost $8. I, no, 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 no. We didn't lose $8. They're Canadian dollars. <laughs> they're like maple leaves, but they're not, they're not the same. They're not the same. <laughs> and then uh, probably a couple of years later, uh, Transactor started sending me US funds, which was nice. I've told this story elsewhere. And you can also find the story of Gooey Duck and why that name is there out on the internet somewhere. Um, 
But one of the things I did for Transactor, which just worked out, is I had been doing some hardware reviews for various magazines. And Transactor had a problem when they had some hardware from the U.S. that needed reviewing that comes across Canadian Customs. And Canadian Customs really didn't believe them that this, the hardware was going to be returned. So they wanted to charge them import duty and not cheap import duty. And so they say we're having this problem, and so they made a deal with me that I would get the hardware from U.S. vendors, and I would do the reviews for a transactor, and I didn't have a customs problem, so the hardware back. So I got to review all kinds of really cool hardware that only transactor would normally touch, I.O. boards, all kinds of neat stuff. Didn't have to buy any. That was fun. I got paid for it. Not a huge amount, but I was always, that was kind of, I was content to write stuff and get paid for that, and if I had known Kent, God help us, we might have started manufacturing some of this stuff, and I don't know how I have. have. Who knows? Who knows? That's right. Okay, no more questions? Thank you for your Thank attention. Thank you. Appreciate it.